Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. People might not realize this, but we rarely are in the same room. But just this last week, I spent quite a lot of time with you. And now I'm happy that we're far apart. (laughs) You're happy that we're no longer in the same room. (laughs) I do have the pathologies of an only child. What can I tell you? People keep asking me about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the economic fallout. Something really stands out here that I don't think enough people are paying attention to. That is how civil the response has been from not just other governments, but also from people. The world is not responding militarily, but they're responding with tremendous economic impact with sanctions and financial freezes and this sort of thing. And then you get lots of interesting stories like the following two Polish volunteers have been leaving baby strollers at train stations for arriving Ukrainian mothers. Families who are fleeing the Ukraine arrive by train in Poland. This was spontaneous. People just started leaving strollers for their kids. Also, spontaneously, some people decided that they could use Airbnb to help the people in Ukraine by renting their houses. Not with the intent of occupying them, but with the intent of effectively using Airbnb as a conduit to send the cash to the needy Ukrainians. I think some of this is due to the fact that, and you and I have observed this amongst high school students for a number of years now, people seem to be getting kinder. They seem to be treating each other with more kindness than they did when we were young. It's the way we tell them to at the end of every podcast. Be nice to each other if someone's listening. (laughs) It's had this ripple effect across the entire world. But it's that. It's also, I think, for all of the complaints people make about social media, I think this is a positive thing that's coming from social media. We're connected individually. Human beings are connected in a way that we've never been connected before. I think that causes people to see the humanity in each other. It's hard to think of the Ukrainians as some hypothetical group of people. They're very real. It's hard to think of the Russians as evil when clearly it's Putin. The Russian people are are a different matter. And I think that individual level of connectedness is really important. I don't want to give the kudos entirely to social media. I think it has a lot to do with emails and texting and the fact that we have these handheld devices that we can communicate so easily. But it's a fascinating development. I tell the children about a time when all the international news I got was sandwiched in one half hour slot at the end of an evening. Yeah. That's it. Now I can communicate in real time with anyone, anywhere in the space of two seconds. And you can get the story from the ground, not something that's filtered through other people. That's right. And I don't want to pick on Walter Cronkite unnecessarily here. But look, when I was young, when you were young, Walter Cronkite was the final arbiter of what the American people were going to believe the next day. That's right. I'm glad that that's no longer the case. Now, it brings with it the unfortunate turn of events that we've got the proliferation of 24-hour news networks and all the idiocy that they bring to the table. But I think on balance, we're far better off. You also have the proliferation of fake news The cure to that is not to shut down news, it's to get more out there, have more communication. Yeah, that's right. We've just dealt with the abomination that is daylight savings time, but I do have a soft spot in my heart for Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema, and that was only further entrenched by what she said yesterday or the day before. She says, daylight savings time ends tomorrow. Arizona, you know what to do. Nothing. Yeah. When I first came to Arizona, I thought, oh, this is an enlightened view until the week after everybody else had daylight savings time. And I found out that all of the things on my calendar were now an hour off. (laughs) Right. It's affecting you nonetheless. (laughs) Oh, for God's sake, I was instantaneously late for everything for an entire week. (laughs) You start asking some hard questions like, why do all of the other states do this? The reason you always get is that we wanted people to have more hours of sunlight. Well, the sun doesn't shine an hour longer. Everything is exactly the same. You can get up an hour earlier or an hour later. None of this matters. Marco Rubio, I believe, has tried to get rid of this four years running now. I'm getting agitated here just thinking about it. I've already been late for things, and the time just changed two days ago. Right. One of which was this recording. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly right. Our friend Ian Scoble describes it as chronological Keynesianism, 
Keynesianism, of course, the idea that, well, the government spends money and the economy grows. The reality is the government's simply shifting income from the future to the present. So to here, you're not getting more sunlight. You're just shifting it from the front of the day to the back of the day or vice versa. I have yet one more addition to make here, because not only is daylight savings time stupid, having time zones is stupid, too. The entire country of China, it's always the same time no matter where you go. And what would that mean here in the United States? It would mean that I could take a meeting with somebody at 1330 and know what time that was. Not at 7.30 in the morning, plus two hours because I'm in this time zone, or minus three because I'm in that time zone. I've thought about that. With you being in Arizona and I in Pennsylvania, we frequently have this time zone issue. But it occurs to me, if we did have a unified time zone, we'd just have a different problem. And that other problem would be James saying, okay, I agree to a meeting at 1330 hours and then discovering later that 1330 hours is six o'clock in the morning for him. You could adapt your work schedule and the people in Los Angeles would go to work three hours later than the people in New York, as is always the case but they would have a shared time to use. Yeah, but you've got to keep in mind what time they're going to work, because otherwise you're going to be calling them, they're going to be in bed. Yeah, well, sure, but how would you not already know that? Because they're going to work at a different time than you are. I could say, I'll meet you at 1330. You would write that on your calendar, I'd write it on mine, and then we would meet then. Or you'll say, let's meet at 1330, and I say, what the hell is wrong with you? I'm going to be in bed uh, at that go time. Go yourself. What's wrong with me? <laughs> anyway... Moving from this idiocy, which was further compounded by you, I want to move I want to move to California for the foolishness of the week. You might recall that California has an unabiding housing crunch, right, which they turn around and made worse by forcing every new home construction to include solar panels. So the price goes way up. And what happens when that happens? Well, people buy less of the thing, but they need it, and you see where we're heading with this. You've got a worse housing crunch. Enter California Assemblyman Chris Ward, who comes up with this gem of an idea. He wants to propose, or he is proposing, a 25% tax on real estate investors to, quote, level the playing field. Anthony, I've just wound you up. Go. <laughs> so 25% tax on real estate investors. Here's the third grade version. When you tax something, you get less of it. And if you're going to tax real estate investment, guess what you're going to get less of? Those very same houses that California currently has a shortage of. This is textbook economics. Everything they're doing leads to the same conclusion. That is a shortage of housing. If you really want to make a mess of a place, if you want to harm it down to its roots, and you can't afford a military strike, go with rent control. You'll do more damage with rent control than you'll do with almost any other harebrained scheme that you could come up with. I feel bad for the good people of California, but most of them keep voting for this year in, year out, and now they get what they paid for. People get the politics they deserve. Well, there is a positive externality here, and that is California consistently sets itself up as a warning to the rest of us. It's also a negative externality because they're all going to move here. <laughs> and we vote have this, for the same things. We have this inflow from California into Tucson, and then they say things like, Maybe if we had a 25% tax on real estate investors, people would be able to afford a house. And we're back. So every time I see a California plate coming into town, I get a little bit nauseous. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. If you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding, send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. This week, Christopher McMahon and Jason King join us. They are both professors of theology at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. They both have authored numerous books and articles in the field of moral theology. They both received their PhDs from the Catholic University of America. Both are long-standing friends of both mine and James. And there the similarities end, because interestingly, Jason leans in favor of free markets, and Chris is somewhat skeptical of markets. 
We welcome both of them this week on Words and Numbers to talk with us about subsidiarity. Thank you very much for having us. Good to be here. This is the first time we've had two guests simultaneously. This is going to be fun. James and I have talked about subsidiarity many times on Words and Numbers, and being a political scientist and economist, basically not knowing much about subsidiarity other than how it impacts our particular fields, we thought it would be a good time to get a couple of theologians on, specifically Catholic theologians, to tell us what does subsidiarity really mean from the perspective of the people who came up with the term in the first place. And Ant, if I can just gently correct you, we haven't talked about subsidiarity all the time you have. I talk about federalism all the time. <laughs> Actually, that's a good place to start. What's the official definition? I'm going to give you my summary of the official definition because I didn't pull up the compendium of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. But it's basically that you solve problems at the appropriate level. That's really what it is. And that can be lower levels if it's more personal decisions affecting people. But as things become broader and affect more people, they start to need to move up in certain kinds of levels. And the idea is that you don't go too low to solve a problem or you don't go too high to solve a problem. So that's my kind of classroom definition of how that works. And let me go ahead and read from the compendium. <laughs> there you go. Get that official <laughs> teaching. <laughs> the compendium was put out by the Vatican office on is it the Office on Peace and Justice, I believe? Pontifical Council of Peace and Justice. It says the following. Subsidiarity is among the most constant and characteristic directives of the church's social doctrine and has been present since the first great social encyclical, that's Rerum Navarre. It is impossible to promote the dignity of the person without showing concern for the family groups, associations, local territorial realities. In short, for that aggregate of economic, social, cultural, sports-oriented, recreational, professional, and political expressions to which people spontaneously give life and which make it possible for them to achieve and affect social growth. This is the realm of civil society understood as the sum of the relationships between individuals and intermediate social groupings, which are the first relationships to arise and which come about thanks to the creative subjectivity of the citizen. This network of relationships strengthens the social fabric and constitutes the basis of a true community of persons, making possible the recognition of higher forms of social activity. You're not helping me out here, Chris. <laughs> How does any of that connect to what Jason said and what I've said in the past as well, that it's about decision making at the lowest possible level? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And I think in that paragraph, it points to this recognition that subsidiarity reflects the spontaneity of our social organizations and the spontaneity of those social organizations which are the building blocks of our civil society, happen at the level of family and of, like they said, recreational and social interactions and build up to larger social and civic structures, like a federal government or something like that. So much of Catholic teaching comes through Thomas Aquinas, which is his appropriation of Aristotle. And you've got this movement that he's really stealing from Aristotle of like human beings don't function as individuals, so you need families, but then families don't get along. So you need some kind of mechanism by which families don't have to feud and fight all the time. And this is a common language and a small polis that's there. And so you end up with that kind of building up of things to help individuals thrive. But if it starts to become too dominant from the top down, you start to lose all of those pieces and then the whole thing will come cascading down. Thomas is thinking of a kind of feudalism society, but when you get to Rerum Navarum, which is 1861, 91, 91. 90, 91, then you're starting to get the shift away from feudalism into the modern nation state, uh, developing of the early onset of capitalism. And so you're getting restructuring of society there. And so they're starting to think along those same kinds of parameters, individuals and families, civic societies, but then also how do those fit into this new political and economic groupings? And just as a quick clarification, although it appears in Rerum Novarum, it receives emphasis in 1931 with Pius XI. And so you've seen the rise of socialism, communism, and fascism. And so these collective identities, these state realities that sort of co-opt individuality, I always think of the Borg from Star Trek, 
that's the most extreme caricature of what subsidiarity is meant to remedy. This understanding of the state that takes over everything, that takes over all individuality, all spontaneity, all creativity, and has it serve this collective identity. And that's what Pius XI was in particular pointing at when he emphasized subsidiarity in 1931. What you're describing from the Catholic perspective of subsidiarity is operationally pretty much identical to what I would describe as free markets and what James, I'm sure, would describe as federalism. The thing that comes to my mind is spontaneous order via Friedrich Hayek, this idea that wherever human beings live together, certain things are just emergent phenomenon. As the only non-Catholic in the room, it seems obvious to me that we have a very similar toolkit when we start talking about these things. I'm wondering if you guys ever read Hayek, and if you do, how it fits. I'm out. I already see Chris shaking his head. But... <laughs> there is some overlap. I think where the Catholic social teaching would diverge from Hayek is they're a lot more comfortable with state actors and political actors. Right. They definitely want to circumscribe them. And the Catholic Church has this funny relationship and sometimes they're favored by the political order and sometimes they aren't. And so they want the political order to function and believes it has a role, but they're also aware it can overstep those boundaries. So they will sometimes be much more critical, like in the rise of fascism and communism, of uh, political entities. But then when you move out of that, like when the Soviet Union collapsed and the U.S. is sort of in ascendancy, they switch a little bit and become a little bit more suspicious of the economy and rely more heavily on political structures. That's where I would say that sort of divergence is. I think the idea of spontaneous order coming out, absolutely. They think human beings are fundamentally relational. You put them out there, they're going to organize into some kind of entity, some way, shape, or form. And they think that's a good thing and sort of fine. But they're also a lot more comfortable with political structures, especially the nation state and its ability to act. I hear you struggling with the same thing that free market economists struggle with, which is spontaneous order is the source of all sorts of wondrous things economically, but you need a government to maintain, if nothing else, property rights to set the rules of the game to make sure that people adhere to the rules. And that sounds all well and good, but functionally, where does that stop and where does spontaneous order start? And that's not at all clear. There's no day one. There's no ground zero for spontaneity. There's already structures and hands and ideologies and forces at work to circumvent authentic spontaneity. And you have forces manipulating and creating and distorting. And so at the end of the day, what looks like spontaneity is really manipulation. And what's the responsibility of the state or the responsibility of the church, for example, to secure the common good in the face of these sometimes unacknowledged forces that compromise that authentic spontaneity. I'm with you 100% there. And I would imagine James would be as well. He actually uses the term common good more than I do. The problem is defining what is the common good, because it becomes all of a sudden a catch-all for every single thing I want to do. <laughs> and to give credit to the other side, people who are of strict libertarian bent will tend to go the other direction and claim, well, there is no common good. And I don't think that's exactly right either. No. When I talk about the common good in my classrooms, it's easier to come up with a few examples that work rather than hash it out. The roads is the thing that I always use. The definition of the common good in Catholic social teaching is it's the good of each and the good of all. And it wants to hold those two things together, that you can't have the good of all set by sacrificing the good of each person. And you can't have the good of each person that sacrifices the good of everybody. I think the easy example is always roads. This is something that's good. It's good to have roads for everybody because you can move commerce. People can move from back and forth to work. You can connect up families that are sort of distance. It provides a whole bunch of goods for the collective, but it's also good for me individually. My car lasts a lot longer when there are roads, not in the winter in Pittsburgh, but <laughs> generally speaking, they tend to last a little bit longer because I'm driving on the roads. It makes my life a lot easier. I'm paying for it in some ways in taxes, but I could never pay for it by myself. So that's an easy example. But then when you start to scale out from things like Little League baseball diamonds, and then when you start to scale up, what is it like for the state of Pennsylvania or a whole nation? That's where it starts really becomes sort of difficult. And then also it becomes really difficult too, because there's not a consensus on what the good is. 
And there's a shift that happens from the medieval world where you did have a sense of what the good was. And it was agreed upon by, I was going to say agreed upon by everybody, but probably just the feudal lords (laughs) that were there. And so you had a sense of what the good was. And then the primary moral category was friendship because friendship is rooted in commitment to shared goods. That kind of breaks down for a whole host of reasons. And then when you get the emergence of the modern nation state, it's sort of founded on a premise that there's not really a common good that's defined politically. It's processes that enable us to work together with divergent senses of the good. And so then the primary moral categories drop from friendship and community to principles and decision-making and conscience. And so you have that little bit of that shift. It's sort of easy, I think, if you're talking about the common good of a campus or the common good of a small community. But when you start to scale up, you're going to struggle with that a little bit. It's very difficult to decide what the common good actually is, to write it all down, Mm -hmm. to get everything caught in a snapshot. That said, aren't you engaged in a bit of a clever dodge when you talk about each and all? Because there's a fundamental friction between those two things. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, if we're looking at the good of all, we're really asking some people to forfeit their vision of the good. And just to give maybe a relatively cheap example, if we're going to talk about the roads, well, eminent domain is going to carve out your front yard so the road can go through. And we have all these sorts of things that come up all the time, but that is the friction between the one and the many. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure there's ever really an answer to that friction. I would say that the friction doesn't necessarily mean that it's not good. (laughs) No, I agreed, but it's not good for all. I think there's a deeper point behind this, which I think for my theology mind is more interesting. I got three kids. There's things I make my kids do that they do not like, and they would not consider it for their good. And I would argue that it is in their good. (laughs) And I think long-term it is in their good. And so there's a sense where I'm like, actually, it's good for the whole family. That's also something good for you. You're going to do your homework. You're going to go to this competition. And there's that friction there. Again, that's a simple example. There's clearly other bigger problems when you start to scale up. What it does is it gets me to this deeper point that I want to make is that with Christianity, I think you've got this belief that at the core of everything, those two things should go together. The good of the individual and the good of everybody should go together. But we don't live in this perfect world. We live in this broken world. And so you're going to constantly have that competition going out. It goes to this theological belief. Do we believe that we're at root fundamentally good and communal or at root fundamentally combative? So I'm not a Hobbesian, I guess I would say. And this is where I come back to Aristotle and my anthropology. When I think of these questions, I go back to the Second Vatican Council and the way in which the Second Vatican Council tried to articulate an understanding of revelation in terms of a pilgrim church making its way through history rather than the static deposit of sort of knowledge or principles or beliefs that At some level, this is theological, and so this isn't really speaking to Jim's main point, but from a theological perspective, that coming to know the will of God, coming to be friends with God, being transformed into that ultimate destiny of the human person, that's something that unfolds over the course of history. And I don't want to get Hegelian about it, but at the same time, there's something also eschatological about the human journey that what the good is, is not a given. It's a destiny that needs to be worked out in the course of human events. And so it's not just a fallenness that precipitates the dialectic or the dialogue. It's really the nature of the human person in history, and that there's something fundamental about human existence that requires us to be in dialogue that brings us to that understanding of common good that remains in the eschatological future. We're never going to get it. It's one of these asymptotic pursuits that arrives not from within humanity, but from without, but on this journey. That kind of patience with one another, that kind of humility with one another becomes part of that spontaneous social fabric that subsidiarity presupposes. I want to add on that real quick. It's actually affirming what I think Harrigan said. The Catholic social teaching, there's a lot of those pieces that actually sort of go together. And Jim, you're right. When a lot of times the common good becomes this kind of cover for the ability to extract sacrifices from some group or the other, that really does become a problem where you've got small groups of people that are asked to make those kinds of sacrifices. If you add to subsidiarity this option for the poor, 
one of the functions of that is to make sure that that common good is not used in ways that are just a cover for exploiting those who don't have the resources to stop the freeway from plowing through their neighborhood. Can you define option for the poor? It's evaluating social structures by their impact on those that are most vulnerable. Most vulnerable. Looking at things and say, who does this work for? Usually it almost always works for the wealthy. It works for the middle class. And then you're kind of testing about whether it's actually working by those that are most vulnerable. I want to go back to this concept of the common good, because Jason, you said something that I could latch on to. I thought, great. And then you went on and said something else that blew it all to hell. So <laughs> perfect. <laughs> what you started with is what I heard was the common good is that which is good for each and all. And I'm mm-hmm. parsing that to mean something that's good for people in the aggregate and good for each person individually. And you give the example of roads plus or minus some noise, I can go with that. Each individual Mm -hmm. gets benefit from the roads and the roads benefit all of us communally. And then I think about other things that maybe don't fit that well. For example, forgiving student loans. That might be good for us in the aggregate, maybe, but it's certainly not good for each of us. It's good for some of us, but others it isn't. Or subsidizing mortgages with the mortgage interest deduction, same kind of thing. So I'm hearing your definition initially and thinking, okay, while I may not be able to use this to identify definitely this is the common good and definitely this isn't, I might be able to use it to rank order things. These are things that are more like the common good. These are things that are less like the common good until you went and said, well, in an ideal world, those two things, what's good for each should be the same as what's good for all. And That violates everything I understand about economics. That is, that we're all different. You have different desires and abilities than I do, and therefore, consequently, it's not possible Mm -hmm. that everything could satisfy each and all. Can I qualify that? (laughs) Yeah, please. (laughs) By ideal, I don't mean a simplified utopia. I mean a vision of where things were intended to be. So if you draw Dante's image of heaven, which... It's allegorical, but what it's got is different kinds of levels, different kinds of people, different kinds of functions, and yet there's a community, a collaboration of things that are going on there. And so it's sometimes portrayed as like a choir, so everybody's got different voices and different roles, but there's a kind of unity that sort of comes together. So I'm not advocating for the board collective. Maybe it's better this way is Jesus's vision of heaven is the wedding banquet. It's a bunch of people singing and dancing. Because you're there, the whole celebration is better. You're also enjoying that whole celebration. That's more precise in how I'm envisioning that. Because Chris is right, that as you're working through the common good, it's going to vary over different economic structures, political structures over time, over communities. And you're always going to be sort of working and dialoguing towards it, in addition to all of the brokenness that comes into that piece. But you're always striving for that image of the wedding banquet. And that, I think, is precisely the point. That sort of Shangri-La or utopia or whatever is something that awaits the consummation of history. And so what people are called to, at least in a Christian theological vision, they're called to this dialogue, this engagement, this back and forth that allows them to begin to discern and approximate the common good in concrete places and at concrete times. And that's going to evolve and change. And it's going to require the individual to articulate their needs, their wants, their desires in relationship to a larger group priority. And the larger group, the majority, if you will, is required to be attentive to that. And in that dialogue, something like the common good begins to get approximated in different places. And that's really at the heart of what we mean by Catholicity. Catholicity is not a Borg-type uniformity. Catholicity really is about diversity and a kind of commonality, a communion in that diversity, so that what is being worked out over here in Pitcairn and what's being worked out over here in Monroeville and what's being worked out over there in Uniontown or in Shadyside, that these things are all going to be different. And they're going to require some kind of engagement and not simply isolation. You get attempts at this in Christianity to try to embody those things. And what you have in the church is a community of communities. The easy example of this is Jesuits and Franciscans and Benedictines and a bunch of people trying to set up different kinds of communities. The only thing I would add to what Chris said is that sometimes you try this and then they kill you. So 
<laughs> right. <laughs> so try to live this stuff out and it might work and it might be a good witness. And then the other time you end up in a trial in the middle of the night and dead by evening. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask the question on behalf of all non-Catholics everywhere. What's the takeaway for us? What are we supposed to think about this thing that you guys all believe and that we might not really even understand? And we might believe it if we understood it. I would say get your heads out of national politics and focus on the school board, focus on the rec league, focus on places like that. That's where values and commitments and the good gets discerned and served. Everything you're saying now was something that Tocqueville got to back in the 1830s, 1840s. There's this, I think, long tradition of looking at America and seeing it in a very specific way in a way from the ground up rather than from the top down. It seems that we're all on the same page to some significant degree here. I think so, certainly formally. To throw out an example, a really sort of rough example of some of the issues around subsidiarity and the way it butts up against another principle of Catholic social teaching, that is the principle of solidarity. So thinking about the way in which the school systems are organized, you have a super strong homeschool group where there's this understanding that parents and families are the first teachers of children. And that's a real example of subsidiarity, that parents need to teach their children. But then you have a tension with the defined curriculum of a school district and of a state. And then you have funding issues that wind up revolving around neighborhood property values so that what's going on in Hempfield versus what's going on at Greensburg, Salem, versus what's going on in Pitcairn are very different things. And what's possible in those settings are very different given economic circumstances. So how do you balance the needs of the kids from Hempfield and the property values at Hempfield and the latitude parents have to engage in homeschooling versus what's going on in West Philadelphia in McKeesport and Braddock when it comes to school funding and curriculum development? You have some serious tensions around the dynamics of solidarity and subsidiarity. And within Catholic social teaching, it's that kind of tension that really demands our attention because sacrificing one in favor of the other is not acceptable. Part of what subsidiarity does is try to ensure that these smaller divisions from individuals and families and communities and cities are not instrumentalized. There's an inherent good in them. There's something that needs to be preserved here. You can't take away an individual's agency or disrupt the family or the local community. There's something that's integral to those things and can't be instrumentalized. Part of Catholicism's understanding of that is to try to hold the integrity of each of those pieces, however you're organizing society. I think it does two other things that I think are really sort of important. It holds you to a transcendent value. You can talk whatever you want to. There is goods that transcend our particularity that you have to behold to. Goodness, truth, love. That's pretty important because if those smaller divisions start to become instrumentalized or exploited or neglected, there can be an appeal back up to these are goods that transcend these local realities and thereby critique it and stop it. Now, once you have those kind of transcendent values, they're really extremely dangerous too, because those then can be used as ways to take advantage of or exploit this. I'm doing this in the name of truth or doing this in the name of goodness, right. and it really is just a kind of power move in order to exploit people. And so the other piece that I would say Catholicism adds to it is that it has a kind of critique of that. It can be hypocrisy. It can be false prophets. It's got a sense that there's not beholden to a specific political party or a specific class or specific economic interest. So there's always that kind of critique that if people start to claim truth and goodness, you got to be very, very careful as you're doing that. Otherwise, it can be just a cover for power or money or some kind of broader sort of self-interest. The Catholic subsidiary gets held within those broader scales of values, but also provides a mechanism for critiquing the danger that that reality presents. I'm really enjoying this because I'm discovering the two of you are my nemesis in a very fundamental way in that economics is all about here are two things and you can't have both of them. And Catholic social thought seems to be all about here are two things and you have to have both of them. <laughs> oh, and they're mutually exclusive. <laughs> it is a both and sort of religion. It's God and it's human. It's God and creation. We try to put everything together and then think that it's all going to work out nice and easy. This is the oscillation within Catholicism. You get 
everything's wonderful. It's going to be great. And then it's not. And so then they think everything's terrible and it's going to help. <laughs> and then we'll go back to everything sort of wonderful. And then we try to have both of those things at the same time. <laughs> Chris, I'll ask you this, and Jason is a follow-up, but Jason, I know you're more of a free market type. I'm expecting your answer. Chris, I know that you tend to be somewhat skeptical of markets. My question is, everything we've talked about here, to me, points to what I would call free markets. Let decision-making be done at the lowest possible level, understanding that there are some decisions that can't be done at the individual level, and they should be bumped up, and so too can't be done at the local or state level, and they should be bumped up. But I walk away from this discussion of subsidiarity thinking, yeah, this is pointing to what I point to all the time, which is free markets. And yet I know you're skeptical of markets. Am I missing something here? No, I am skeptical of markets, but I'm not anti-markets. I think markets in their most pristine form from the perspective of subsidiarity are the heart and soul of economic life and the pursuit of the common good. That being said, again, I go back to my point that there's no ground zero, there's no day one, there's no tabula rasa. There are structures in place that have markets operate beyond the agency of individuals and even agencies of corporate identities. And it's that kind of presence that I think there needs to be a vigilance about. For example, not every desire I have is going to contribute to my good or your good or the good of this quartet right here. I have all kinds of desires that come to me and I know that I I struggle with them, I fight with them, but there are also desires that articulate themselves within my agency that I'm not aware of. Even just the way in which technology can predict my moods, my wants, my desires, and then amplify them in ways to affect me as an individual and to affect us collectively so that it steers us away from a common good to the good of a particular corporate interest or the interest of a particular political vision or something like that so that human desires and economic activity become instrumentalized not for the common good but for the perceived good of some particular actor. But I would say that fundamentally from the perspective of subsidiarity, Markets are the stuff that create the possibility for our pursuit of the common good. But it's the specter of all those other forces that winds up making intervention or regulation important in many instances. Jason, do you have a contrary perspective? Markets deliver so many goods. And if you look at the quality of life that's moved in since the Industrial Revolution, since capitalism, all of those things are good. And so my questions are usually just twofold. The ground rules functioning justice system that's fair, market rules where everybody knows the playing field. So those are things that kind of the limits of those pieces. I get nervous when markets start trading in human beings. Don't just mean slavery, but family life, marriages. There's some things that it just doesn't handle well, but that's not a critique about markets. It's just not everything solved by markets, even if it's pretty expansive. And the thing that I guess I would add as more positive is responsiveness to human beings. You can always head down wrong roads politically or economically. The ability to respond and adjust course, markets seem to respond much quicker and much more agile to those needs. So I think if you're talking subsidiarity, that's where the reflection starts to get at it. If you're making decisions at these levels, you can make those and make those adjustments as needed. That's pretty important, pretty significant, especially for making people's lives better. I use this example of McDonald's all the time. They never try to cause controversy. They just withdraw whatever problems that's there and adapt. With styrofoam boxes for a while, they just pulled back. We're doing recycling stuff. And then it was supersized me. They just withdrew that from the menu and went back to small, medium, or large. You want healthy food? There's your healthy food. They just respond to whatever's there and they try not to cause controversy. You can beat up on them for a bunch of reasons. Even employment practices, they shifted their employment practices. So I'm not advocating for McDonald's, but I always find that as an example about how things kind of respond in ways that enable markets to shift in response to what people perceive as what's important. And I would just add to all of that, if I'm suspicious about how markets work, I'm also very suspicious about how governments work and about how state legislatures or federal legislatures or regulators work because they are the same human beings. And they're the beast that constantly wants to be fed. 
they're also a problem that needs to be disciplined with the dialectic of democracy and reason and economic realities. There's no angel here that's going to fix all problems. We have lots of people who these days argue for things like the medieval vision of society is what we ought to adapt or something like that. And I'm like, holy smokes, that is so freaking bizarre. <laughs> Actually, something like a well-informed, engaged liberal democracy is far from perfect and susceptible to all kinds of distortions, but it's actually a pretty good dynamic, and its evils can be identified by educated, vigilant, and good-willed people. There is a marketplace of ideas. There are arguments to be made. There are platforms to be had, like this one, where people remain engaged, and one doesn't have to despair. I like ending on no despair. That's actually kind of nice. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. This has been excellent. Thanks. That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Be sure to join us next week when we talk to fewer people and hopefully have something every bit as interesting. Until then, you can follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. You can join our Words and Numbers backstage Facebook group where the conversation continues. And you can send us email words and numbers podcast at gmail.com and if you'd like to send hate mail addressed to either chris mcmahon or jason king what? feel free to do that also <laughs> okay we'll forward it right along don't you worry aunt chris jason see you guys later see you next week james